So this big idea of chapter four is making sure that objects only know as much about each other as is absolutely necessary and keeping everything else hidden. And that ensures simplicity and that makes future changes easier to handle. Sandy talks about different kinds of ways that you can protect, quote unquote, your methods from being exposed. And that's with keywords, uh, public, protected, and private. Public is default, by the way. But protected and private, when you put those in a Ruby file, uh, the ones below it will be either protected or private. She has this, this list of four qualifications, basically, of what a good public interface method would look like. And they're basically, they're explicitly identified that way. They'd be more about what than how. They'd have names that are unlikely to change. This is because they'll be mentioned throughout your code base. And you don't want to have to go hunt that down to change them if you change the name in the place where it's defined. And the last one is to take a hash as an options parameter. I am not a huge fan of the last one, but I'll show you what that looks like. And I can certainly see why that's touted as being a good thing, but I think it adds unnecessary boilerplate to your, to your actions. So basically the idea is if you take just a hash rather than explicitly saying the first param, the second param, you'll, you'll have the benefit of being able to pass params in in any order that you'd like. But on the other hand, so like for example, when I'm calling it here, I could say first is Brian, second is Becky, but I could also have said second is Becky, first Brian, and it would still, it would still act the same way. And, and that's great. And actually sometimes tagging on an options hash to the end of even explicitly named params is not a bad idea because that just sort of gives you flexibility in the future of if you wanted to call numbers params with uh, another, like a third param, for example, you'd be able to do that. This is how those, how those pan out both in taking a hash as, as the param versus explicitly named ones. And they have the same, they have the same output either way. So it's not, not a huge deal. So that's, that's for public methods. Protected ones are ones that should be for internal use. The, if, if you've been following along with the paradigm of what versus how, um, protected ones would be great for the how, and that's doing the actual transformation and stuff. So if, if you're following along from the example in my last video, the social security number validation would be great as a protected one or even a private one, um, because that's basically just internal use. The, the class will be calling it on itself and updating the social security number accordingly. Private is a domain sort of for the most unstable methods that you have, the ones that are still works in progress, and so on. These, I, I think in application, in, in the real world, these are not followed as strictly as the book would suggest, but again, these are just sort of like the best practices that you should kind of aspire to if you, if you can. And the, it'll, it'll do you favors <laughs> for the future when you're maintaining the code. One of the last sections for the chapter is about the law of Demeter. And that says that you shouldn't have more than one dot in your calls, like customer.bicycle.wheel.rotate is given in the book, or something like user.ssn.validate for my, my example. This is because if you have a lot of calls strung together like that, when you make changes in the future, they'll be harder to do because you have to go back to every place where those methods are referenced and update them. Otherwise, unexpected behavior might arise or even things might just break entirely. Be careful with stuff like that. And if you have more than 
more than one or two dots, rethink how you're doing that. <laughs> um, but that said, it's it's okay sometimes, especially if you're looking up attributes rather than like making any adjustments or transformations to data. And so, for example, something like user.first.ssn is totally legit because you're basically just saying, I want to look up the social security number of the first user. And that's not going to break anything, nor is there really anything that could change in the future that would make that not work. So that's about all for chapter four. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you in the next video.